So the question was, and the question is, where is the record of our sin written? And it is written. Tell me where it might be written. You can say, well, it's written down in heaven. Okay. Um, where? The book of life. That's up there. Okay. But the book of life um, is about those basically whose sins are forgiven. Who said blotted out? Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you. That's where we got to go. Yeah, but they you can be there until they are blotted out. They are there. I mean, yeah. So I'm going to pose the question again. Where is the record of your sin or my sin or our sin written down? And it's written down in here for each one of us. For each one of us. See, the book of Hebrews explains this transaction in the judgment scene. And it says clearly and repeats it. This is we're talking about in Hebrews 8 and 9. It says clearly that all the blood and all the sacrifices and all the offerings and all the rivers of blood could not serve to do something. What is it that it did not accomplish? It did not clear the conscience, it says. Jesus says, I forgive you. Your Father forgives you. And yet in our condition, your condition and mine right now, if Jesus should show up in holiness and in the glory of his holiness, you and I would either be blotted out or we would run and shriek in terror trying to get away. There's something about the gaze of God that we think of with human being sinners that we treat as a negative, but it's not. Old Testament prayers are for God to smile on us, look on us, uncover his face for us. But something has to take place first. That's what we want to talk about. Sin is written, the Bible says, in every member of our being. And how is sin transmitted from one person to another genetically? And not just genetically. Can sin move through air? Come on. Yes, yes it can. How does it do that? Evil speaking. Sin can be transmitted or transferred from one place to another and one person to another. Now we know that's true because Lucifer was the first sinner and look how many sinners have come to be as a result of one. Of one. That was demonstrated again in the garden. Eve was one person who made one choice, one wrong choice. It went from Eve to Adam, from Adam and Eve to all of us. I'm going to try and use the board, but sparingly, and ask you to follow along. I'm going to read a few words that I've jotted down slowly and carefully and deliberately because I want you to get the point before we move to the next point on the board. With the exception of six chapters, virtually the entire Bible contains a revelation do you know what the word revelation on the book of Revelation actually means? In the Greek, do you know what the word revelation is actually means? It means an opening, a disclosure. It's a seeing with understanding, okay? Virtually the entire Bible contains a revelation, a revealing or opening of God's plan to save or restore mankind. Now, when we say mankind, are we talking about angels? No. We're talking about human beings. 
When we say mankind, are we talking about men only? We're talking about all of us as a family. So God is proposing and bringing to pass to reality a plan to restore mankind to our Edenic state. Edenic meaning the Garden of Eden. Now there's already a problem in this matter, and here it is, you and I were never in an Edenic state. You and I were polluted before we were born. Because we were born in a polluted world, polluted atmosphere, polluted sin, polluted body. So when we say or reason that God is going to restore us, mankind, to our former Edenic state, uh, you and I have no former. So you and I are recorded and accounted in Scripture to be kin to Adam and Eve. That was the original record, Adam and Eve. And kin to whom else? Come on. Because the first Adam and the first Eve could not deliver you and me. Could not save you. Once they were sinners, they cannot save you and me. So who are we looking for? Genesis 3.15, who are we looking for? A Messiah. A Savior. A promised one to come. And who is that one? Of course, it's Jesus, but we refer to Jesus as the second Adam. That's A-D-A-M, not A-T-O-M. The second Adam. So we're talking, and we want to begin here looking at, thinking about, trying to understand a plan that God and as far as I can see, no one else has devised. God has devised the plan that we refer to as the plan of salvation. Okay? Now, there are many ideas as a consequence of people reading a few verses in the Bible or putting verses together, but many, many, many honest-hearted, devoted Christians believe that we are going to have this restoration in these bodies and this life. So I'm going to take you to the next question. On the resurrection morning, do we come up with the old bodies that have the record of sin written in the members? Come on. On the resurrection morning, do we come up sinful, and then we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. No. 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 We're not going to come up with the old body. Listen to this verse of Scripture. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, it actually says. Old things are, ooh, we want to get to this passing away. What in the world does it mean old things are passed away? All things are become new. That's what you and I really want. That's what I believe every human being wants, desires, is to be brand spanking new with no guilt. No evil within, and no evil without. Oh, I believe that's God's plan, to take care of the evil within and the evil without. <clears throat> the early record of Scripture is most often referred to by Bible believers. There are a lot of people on this rock who are not Bible believers. They were not, they were not exposed to the Bible early in life or along the way. And so they're not, we cannot refer to them as Bible believers. Some believe because they were not exposed, therefore they're lost. I don't believe that. God so loved Bible believers that. So the early record is most often referred to by Bible believers 
as the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. I think I need to put a couple of lines on the board. We've done this, but we need to see it again. And what we're going to do is narrow the focus. We're going to get the big picture, and then we're going to work down and down and down because this plan is taking us to a single moment in sanctuary time, in sanctuary event, a single moment. And everything else, I don't want to say is secondary, I don't want to say it's irrelevant, I don't want to say it has no meaning or no merit, but there is a moment, there is a point, and everything is designed to bring sin and sinners to this moment. So what we have here is the Old Testament, Old Covenant. And something happened here so that we now refer to this as the New Testament, New Covenant. And of course, what happened was the cross. What was, what was the great change that took place at the cross? We're talking about the plan. This is the plan of salvation. First three chapters of Genesis, last three chapters of Revelation. Everything between is sanctuary time. Sanctuary time is all about blood and death and a lot of unseemly things. Do we want a sanctuary to go with us throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity? No, we don't. We would like for the record to be expunged, erased, removed. But that's not possible and it's not going to happen until this plan that God has devised is worked out, is completed. Now, tell me what the old covenant or old agreement meant in simple terms. Come on, real simple. Obey and disobey and that's it. That's exactly what the Lord said to both of them in the garden. If you do right, you'll live. If you do wrong, you'll die. Were they in any position to understand what death was all about? If you've never seen, never experienced, how can you know? You have nothing in your life, your circumstances to compare something with. So when God was lovingly, kindly warning them that if you do this, you'll die. They had no real understanding of death. How long did it take them to get an understanding? Till their first two children. Didn't take long, did it? Then they began to understand what death really means. Now, I don't know, I cannot convince myself that God took the lives, killed those animals in the garden for the covering he put over them. I, I don't know that they watched or observed the bloodletting. I don't know that. I think it's very possible that God did all of this in their presence. Tell me what the new agreement is. Tell me what the new covenant is. Yeah, that's the new, that's the new covenant. You can check it out in Jeremiah. You can check it out in Hebrews. I will write my law where? On their inward parts. And their sins I will cast into the 
depths of the sea and uh, remember them forever. Now, how is that possible with God? We're not talking about you and me. I forget all kinds of things, especially what I don't want to remember. How is it possible for God to look at you and me today, tomorrow, a thousand years from now? How is it possible for God to look at you and me and not be reminded of who and what we were? Maybe it has more to do with this expression, uh, your sins I will remember no more and I will cast them into the depths of the sea. What is that referring to in the sanctuary service? The moment when the Lamb speaks. It's become the Lamb's book of life, and to Him judgment is given. And what pronouncement does He make? He that is no righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. So the transaction that is to take place in here, I, I want to be careful that I don't say that your good works and my good works don't count down here right now. They do count. Every good thing that is done counts for goodness. It may not earn me eternal life, but it counts for goodness. It means that I have allowed the Holy Spirit to work in my life. And it's my understanding from Jesus' own lips that the one thing that can cause you to be lost is sinning against the Holy Ghost. So good works matter. They don't save us, but they testify to the fact that we have heard the voice of God we have responded to the voice of God, and we want to do the will of God, even though we don't always perform as we should. Are you listening? Now, tell me what forgiveness means. This is Paul's version. We have forgiveness, you and I, through his blood. So by shedding his blood, he purchased not the sympathy of the Father, not the forgiveness of the Father because Jesus shed blood, but because there was a very legal transaction. Tell me what the legal transaction was that occurred. Come on. The, the wages of sin is what? And God made him to be sin for us. And he came to die. Did he say that he came to die? Yes. For this cause came I. Get out of my way, Peter. He actually <laughs> said Peter was speaking of another power. Get thee behind me. What was it Satan did not want Jesus to do? He hated him. He wanted to kill him. But in doing so, he signed his own. Did Jesus actually say that as he was approaching the cross? Now is this world judged. Now are the... Yes, absolutely. There is something that you and I want, desire, need in this plan of salvation more than anything else. Now this is where the Christian world focuses, right here. Right here. Adventism appeared on the scene about 150, 200 years ago. And it was not the Seventh-day Adventist church in the 1830s and onward. It was actually introduced, the subject of sanctuary in prophecy and the time of the end was introduced through a Baptist Christian, William Miller. Miller had no formal training in the Bible, in history, in the sanctuary or whatever, but he saw that sanctuary times were very much a part of prophecy 
and in that he was correct. He believed that the springtime, the sanctuary spring events, had some role to play, some important major role to play in this plan of salvation. Now, given the disappointment that happened first in 1843, in the spring of 1843, um, those who were following Miller and trying to urge him along and encourage him in the way decided that, no, Jesus was not coming in the spring, but coming in what season of the year? In the fall of the year. This is how we got to October 22 of 1844. I'm not going to go into all of that except to tell you that something was happening 150 to 200 years ago that was refocusing Christian thought. Refocusing Christian thought on an unfinished work in the plan of salvation. Because most Christians said, most Christians believed, most Christians still believe that everything was finished at the cross. The Advent movement was an attempt to bring out of the closet, into the open, into the thinking of Christians, that there is something yet to be accomplished, something undone. Now I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here for a moment, and then we'll put some more up here. Everything that God has done from day one, showing himself in the garden, speaking to Adam and Eve, covering them with animal skins, and on and on and on. Everything that God has done for what we believe now is virtually 6,000 years, human years. Everything that God has done is part of this large plan of salvation. Salvation. Many Christians believe that we already own salvation. But the salvation that is referred to and promised is deliverance from this world of sin, from this body of sin. Did you hear Paul? Who shall deliver me from this body of death or sin? See, we're still here. The things that I know to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Who is going to save me from this body of death? Because that's where the record is written. It's written within us. I told you my professor at seminary, but there may be some who haven't heard this experience. The year I spent in seminary was an eye-opener. A typical class had 40 to 45 ministers or would-be ministers, ministers in the making. And uh, you, you don't just uh, choose anybody to be a professor in graduate school. And that's what seminary is, graduate school. It's not high school, it's not college. It's graduate school. So you expect your professors to be up here in your thinking, up here. And so I'm sitting in the class on this occasion, 40 to 45 ministers or would-be ministers in the class. And the professor posed a question. He said, if a sinner marries a sinner, and they have a child, what will the child be? Come on. He waited for the class to respond, and we said virtually with one voice, a sinner. Okay, he said, if a saint marries a saint, and they have a child, what will the child be? And this whole class fell deathly silent because they understood in an instant that sin is written in us. Mom and dad may be, quotes, converted and baptized and whatever. Uh, can they pass any of that love for God or whatever respect for God along to their children? Yes, they can. 
but they cannot cleanse the heart. They cannot change the record of sin. It's passed from generation to generation. We're all sinners. Now, what you and I want is what David finally came to wrestle with in his terrible experience, and he's praying in Psalm 51, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, please, because he had done terrible things. And he knew the consequence of doing terrible things was that the Spirit of God would what? Go the other way. So he's begging. Why is he begging for the Holy Spirit? Come on, come on. Why is he begging for the Holy Spirit? Because if there's ever going to be a change in him, it requires the working and the presence of the Holy Spirit to change the heart and the mind. You listening? So on the resurrection morning, do we come up with this old body of sin, this old mind and heart of sin? No, we don't. Now, we haven't gotten to the 144,000 in this discussion yet. That's a different, different arrangement. But we're talking about you and me and all those who've lived before us and who may pass away between now and the moment Jesus comes in the clouds. Something, some transaction has to take place before the resurrection morning. Not on the resurrection morning. Before the resurrection morning, something has to take place. And tell me again, what is that pronouncement that is heard in heavenly places in the sanctuary? He that is righteous. If you ask me with the understanding that I have presently, which is certainly not complete and may not even be correct, but if you were to ask me, what is it that you really want from God? What is it? Well, I could say, I want eternal life. But that's rather selfish. I would like to own a half mile of the streets of gold. That would not be virtually selfish. That would be totally selfish. <laughs> what do I really want from God? I want to be able to stand in the presence of God without... without okay is there anything that I can do to bring about that condition the only answer to that is yes by accepting Jesus receiving Jesus accepting what God is going to preach to every kindred tongue nation and people a new government is coming a new king is coming would you like to be part of the new kingdom? It's that simple. Now, if I were asked, what one thing do I really want of or from God? What I want is the guilt, the true guilt of my sin and the record of my guilt to be totally what? Expunged. Uh, erased in scripture and in the sanctuary that transaction is referred to as the blotting out of sin now I want to take you back in your thinking 2,000 years ago to the day of Pentecost the miracles that were occurring were rather limited there were 120 people in that room and the Holy Spirit came into that room like a rushing mighty wind doesn't say that was happening all over Jerusalem doesn't say that at all it was there where they were gathered in the name of Jesus and in answer or obedience to his command don't go anywhere you wait or tarry here until you receive the promise of the father and what was the promise of the father the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came into this room like a rushing mighty wind, and when the rushing sound ceased, what appeared above their heads? 
Fire. Wind and fire, both of these are somehow a revelation and opening to our dull senses of the mighty power and work of the Holy Spirit. So this rushing mighty wind and this these tongues of fire were translated publicly out in the marketplace and at the temple and so forth. When they are driven out into the streets of Jerusalem, 120 of them, and they began speaking in other languages, it says. Now, I have not satisfied myself they were actually speaking in other languages. We can at least deduce that people were hearing in their own language. They might have been speaking in, you know, Hebrew or whatever, and the others may have the miracle was in the hearing. It doesn't matter. Something is taking place that is miraculous. There is a power and an energy that is working that no one, we've never seen it on this wise before. How is it possible? It's not possible except through the miracle working power of the Spirit of God. Now, Peter concluded, this is Peter because he's, I hesitate to use the expression head honcho, but Peter is the one that put himself out front there when people started saying, these are all drunk. This is it. Just pay no attention to these people. Peter said, they're not drunk. But this is that which was promised by Joel, the prophet. It shall come to pass. And Peter turned this expression afterward in the book of Joel to it shall come to pass in the last days. What does that tell us about Peter and what did they believe? That this was what? The time of the end. Okay? This was the time of the end because it shall come to pass. Well, Peter said, uh, you better be careful. You better give heed. Repent, every one of you, that your sins may be Ah, here we are. That is the ultimate, the last work in the sanctuary, which has been transacted, transacting for 6,000 human years. Someone will be alive when the knocking on the door is heard. That's called the first angel's message. Fear God, give glory to Him, because what has come? The hour of judgment. Well, it's His judgment, yes, but it's the hour of His judgment in that He and He alone, this is Bible, He and He alone has the power the, the, to blot out sin. If I could ask for one thing, as a sinner, as a human being, if I could ask God for one thing, I would ask that my record and the sins that I have committed and the sin that is within me be what? Come on, erase, blot it out. So if he's going to blot it out without blotting me out, what is he going to do in that moment? On the resurrection morning, we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This glory will put on glory. We're going to come up out of the graves different than when we went in. That coming up does not occur until after the pronouncement in the sanctuary in heaven. Are, are you, am, I, am I going too fast too far? Am I losing you? In each stage of the sanctuary calling and, and, and work, something has to be met. Some legal requirement has to be met. Then this becomes possible. The, the resurrection morning, when you and I are going to come up as new creations, is possible only because that pronouncement has been made 
by Jesus in the sanctuary. Whoever is righteous, righteous. Whoever is filthy, filthy. So is the great challenge in life, in the spiritual life, is the great challenge getting your name in the book or keeping your name in the book? Yeah. We are not challenged to get our names in the book of life. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the does that mean our names will be forever written in the Lamb's Book of Life? No, because in the hour of judgment that is to come, that is to be preached to all the world, the hour of His crisis or judgment is come. There's going to be a cleaning up of the books. The resurrection morning that you and I are longing for, looking forward to, if we go to sleep first, cannot happen until first Jesus makes that pronouncement in heaven. Now, I want to know, I'm asking you, why is he delaying that announcement or pronouncement? Why not go ahead and do it right now? What? We don't want to lose anybody. Well, every minute that goes on and passes that he doesn't do that, we're losing a bunch of folk. It's a timed event. Now we're getting there. That's where we need to go and focus our attention for a few moments. I can ask God to speed time up. I can ask God to do things that I know are recorded in Scripture as happening only in the great day of the Lord. Well, Lord, I want the great day right now. I want it to come today. So I'm asking you to speed things up. Um, Daniel was told repeatedly, at the time appointed, the what? Anderson. The end will be. At the time appointed. And that, uh, that expression, time appointed, is, is the Hebrew moed. It means uh, the sanctuary times. The sanctuary times. There is a time that is going to come, time that's going to be met, when the heavenly sanctuary is in session and the doors are going to close. So uh, this is what we want to look at. What is it that closes the door? From the time, the daily, whatever that means, is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate, set up, how many days? We touched on this, 1,290. That stands out and stands alone because in both Daniel repeatedly and in the book of Revelation, it's time, times and a half, it's 1,260, it's 40 and two months, all of which are equivalent expressions, but this one has an additional 30 days right here. If you have a Bible right close by, I want you to look at Daniel chapter 12. And we want to look at verses 6 and 7. So I'm going to be quoting from the King James. Daniel 12, that's the last chapter of Daniel's book. And verses 6 and 7. In verses 1 through 5, we have the picture of Michael standing up whoever Michael represents or is, and a time of trouble such as never was coming. And at that time, it says, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found, come on, written in the, in the book. So which side of this blotting out have we come to? Come on. Is Daniel 12, 4 and 5, 
Where is that in relation to the blotting out? It has already transpired. That is exactly what the expression at that time shall Michael stand up means. Because the high priest is not Michael. What is his name? The Christ. What is his name? Melchizedek. He's still in the humanity. When Michael stands up, things have changed. It's on this side of the pronouncement. It's on this side of the pronouncement. At that time, Michael stands up, there's a time of trouble. And some of them that sleep in the dust or those are going to be resurrected. Now, Jesus said, there's a special resurrection coming for you bad guys. You guys who are not only unbelieving, but you are warring against the purposes and words of God. I tell you this, when that time comes, you're going to know who I am. Okay? So he's standing up. And if you keep reading in verses 3 and 4 there, it says that some of them are going to come up to damnation. Some are going to come up to eternal life. I happen to believe this is the moment the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, are waked up and caught up. That's just my assessment. So we know which side of the blotting out pronouncement is. It's when the abomination that makes desolate is set up, standing up, sitting where he ought not, saying what he ought not. It's at this moment that Michael stands. That this is the moment right here. The pronouncement to blot out sins has been made before that. So we know what's going on. Those who are forgiven, where is the record of their forgiveness? Their names are retained in what? The Lamb's Book of Life. And those whose names are not retained, when will they discover, too late, we're talking about folk who lived and have died, but when will they discover their names were not retained in the Book of Life? Come on. There's a resurrection here, and there's a resurrection 1,000 years later. That's when the wicked stand up, wake up, to discover their names were blotted out. Not their sins, their names were blotted out. So if we could, um, I don't know how to illustrate it, but if I take a picture, this, this would be the great picture right here. 6,000 years of humanity and sin. But I would like to understand more about where we are and what God is doing now. We know what he did 2,000 years ago. We know, we know, we've seen, we've read, we've heard. I want to know where we are in this record today. How can we know? Come on. Jesus himself explained it in John 16. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, that's the latter rain, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into how much truth? Now, what is the all truth? Keep reading in the verse, 16, 13, 14. And he will show you things to come. That's what happens in the book of Daniel and Revelation, the things to come. These sanctuary times, that's what was explained to Daniel in Daniel, second vision, chapter 8. At the time appointed, the end shall be. So, 
we have verse 6. You looking at it? Verse 6, chapter 12. And one said to the man standing above the water, above the earth, the one said to the man dressed in linen, how long shall it be till the, what's the next word? The end. The end. Boy, has that question ever been asked before. So if you were trying to read your way through Daniel or even through chapter 12, what, what is the magic point? Magic's not the right word. What is the moment that you're looking for? How long till the end? The blotting out of sin is the end of something. Tell me what it's the end of. Sin. What? Come on. Sin? Yeah, well, whose sin? Mine. No, mine. If I could ask God for any one thing, what do I want? What do I really need? I need the total record of sin in my life. What I've done and what I haven't done and... Or what, what I need most and beyond all else is the total record of sin in my life be what? Erased, Erased blotted out, forgiven. That's, that's what I need more than anything else. Oh no, you need to have your family. Well, if you're blotted out, you don't have your family. Um, I wish... My little grandmother Chadburn were alive today and could sit here. She'd have to turn her hearing aid up all the way to hear us. She wouldn't see much. In her 50s, she lost her hearing and lost most of her vision. She was a um, genuine Christian. Genuine Christian. Her mother, my great-grandmother, became an Adventist Christian when she was just a young woman coming with her family in a covered wagon through the Cumberland Gap. That takes you way back there. She, with her husband and two or three children at the time, um, settled in Rome, Georgia. And it so happens that an Advent an Advent, that's what they were called. An Advent evangelist was preaching the soon coming of Jesus. He was preaching the Advent message. My great-grandmother heard that, accepted it, and so she became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. She had several children, eight or nine as I recall. The only one of those children who became a Seventh-day Adventist with her or after her was my grandmother, Maud Chadburn. Uh, she was a Christian. Forget about Adventists. She was a Christian. Then she became an Adventist Christian. And she loved the second coming of Christ. I wish you could have known her. She tried to witness to, she did witness, not try, she witnessed to all of her children. The only one of her children, and there were seven as I recall, who at some point in life accepted the Advent message was my mother. And before my mother made that decision, my grandmother had witnessed to her for several years. In those several years, my mother had a dream one night. She believed that the dream was from heaven. She dreamed that she was in a river swimming and her mother was swimming beside her. And for a while, we were okay. But then the current began to work against us. Now I'm a young woman, my mother is older, she's the one who should tire, but my mother kept swimming and I found myself following, falling behind, falling behind, falling behind. 
And so my mother related this dream several times in my life, and I remember it and I believe it, that she had the dream. As she began to drop behind, she called out to her mother, Mother, save me. I'm too tired, I can't go on. And she said, my mother looked over her shoulder at me and said, Lily, her name was Lily May. Lily, we have to swim this river alone. What river are we talking about? What is the alone talking about, referring to? We have to, we have to swim this river alone. Can you be saved on somebody else's good deeds? Yes, the good deeds of Jesus. Other than that, no. We have to swim this river alone. So if I could, if, if I were presented with one choice, choose one thing, what would you like to have? The one thing that I would like to have is my record blotted out. Now, if that included blotting me out, so be it, but I want my record blotted out. I don't want any of my record of sin to go on to the other side. And God's not going to allow the record of sin and sinners to go on to the other side. That would not be heaven. I would want my record blotted out. Do I have a right to ask God for that? Come on. Do you have a right to ask God for that? Of course. Do you have a right or do I have a right because I'm worthy? No, I have a right because Jesus purchased that right for me and for you. Now, I believe that virtually everything that is required in the sanctuary has been accomplished except the blotting out of sin. I believe we're living in the closing hours of sanctuary history, sanctuary time. I believe that. Oh, there may be a few years left, but we're talking about 6,000 years of sanctuary time. And I believe we're living at the end of that record. One or two points and we'll close. Most Christians focus on the beginning of the new covenant. I'm a new covenant Christian. I'm a New Testament Christian. Most Christians focus upon the beginning of this new covenant arrangement, which is, according to Scripture, built upon better promises. And they have little, if anything at all, to say about the conclusion or end of this old and new covenant reality. So, this is the old covenant reality. It's still with us. This is the new covenant reality. It's still with us. These two realities will be with us until what? Come on, until judgment closes. And these records are blotted out. And the reality of the new covenant experience, I will put a new heart within you. I will make you new inside and out. That's what we're waiting for. Now the question is, do we understand that what has to happen is not the mark of the beast. Is that going to happen? Oh, absolutely. What is Satan attempting to do with the difficulties that he is going to bring upon the whole world in these closing moments of time? What is he going to, what is he trying to accomplish? He's trying to defeat the purpose of God when the judgment is called into session. Now, we, we, that makes sense, okay? But what is he trying to do with all the troubles that are going to come? Fire, flood, earthquake, war, bloodshed, all these things that are said to come, will come. What is he trying to accomplish in these things? Come on. What? 
well, kill us, but uh, even if we believe in Jesus and, and call upon him, even if I die on the resurrection morning, the right resurrection morning, I believe I'll be resurrected. What does Satan, what is, what is he trying to do? The same thing he has always done. Why was he trying to kill Moses as a baby? Why was he trying to kill Jesus as a baby? What is about to take place in the sanctuary, in the closing moments of sanctuary time, what is about to take place that Satan wants to distract? But the judgment shall sit and take away his dominion. Revelation 12 says he comes down, he is angry because he knows something what? That his days are numbered. That's it. His days are numbered. Once the judgment is called into session, what can you and I know if we know the Scripture? Once judgment is called into session in heaven, what can we know? It is not going to be interrupted. It is going to continue until the finished work in the sanctuary is accomplished. So what is this daily all about? Why in this entire discussion in Daniel, does it come down to Michael saying, now this you need to understand. But understand, from the time the daily is taken away or removed, and the abomination making desolate set up, there shall be. These are the measured days. Measured days of what? Or for whom? Or to whom? This is where Revelation 12 must occur, right here. Satan has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his days are numbered. We can talk about this more another time. This is where you begin to count. Now we're going to count 1,290 days. Only if you live through the 1,290 days can you count the 1,290 days. You listening? Are there some people who are going to live through this time of the end and the time of trouble without tasting death? Then when that pronouncement is made in heaven, he that is righteous put a seal on him. And he that is filthy, blot his name out. He that is righteous, let him be righteous from now on. Okay? So the whole thrust of these measured days at the end is to produce a sealed people. That's where the pronouncement is made. Blotted out. The sealing is that moment when sins are blotted out. The pronouncement is made in the courts of heaven. He that is righteous, put this seal on him. Why do we need the seal? If we're still alive and going to remain alive, we need the seal. The seal is a protection, the covering of God. All right? Now, when it says, when Paul says in the New Testament in Corinthians that we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye from glory unto glory, that is a direct reference to this group of people. Call them the 144,000, call them the remnant, call them the residue, put whatever label you want. But God is going to produce a people who will choose death rather than willfully, knowingly sin against him. Listening? So in the garden, Adam and Eve were tempted. Um, you, you understand that the serpent was there and he was ready to bite. That's what serpents do. He was ready to bite, but more than that, he had a gun and he had a sword and he said, if you don't touch, if you don't take that fruit and if you don't eat that fruit, then I'm going to kill you. What could Satan do back there? 
Nothing. They had, there had to be deception. There had to be a choice made on their part. He could do nothing in the garden. Now we're going to come down here 6,000 years and tell me what he says he's going to do to those who stand up against him and stand up for God. Wipe them out. Not a one, not a single one remains. Uh, Ellen White has a little section in spiritual gifts. You might want to look it up sometime. Uh, she talks about this little company. And all appearances are against them. It looks hopeless. At the voice of God, something happens. And the wicked rush upon this little remnant, this little people, these few people, the wicked rush upon them to slay them. And they extend a hand in the name of the Lord. You listening? Now, do they have power? They have power, but it's exercised power from God through them because they have chosen to be obedient. And whatever God says, that's what they have chosen. So there is a moment, and maybe the 144,000 is a literal number. It doesn't matter. What matters is that God is going to produce witnesses and not one or two. God is going to produce witnesses who are going to be obedient, who are going to love and serve him even unto death if necessary, when everything in this world is against them. Every appearance will be against them. So how are you and I going to stand when this time comes? Come on. Jesus met every test. How did he meet every test? With the word of God and the spirit of God, which was given to him, the scripture says, without measure. So are we promised the Holy Spirit without measure at the end? Yes. 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 And you and I should be in, in anticipation and expectation of this time. I don't, I don't believe it's come yet. I've been in many a prayer meeting where we're praying for the latter rain. I, I don't believe it's time for the latter rain yet. I wish it were, but I believe there are specific events outlined in the prophecies. And when that time comes, God's going to pour out His Spirit. What we want to be, what we want to be in that moment is like those 120 in the upper room. Praying for, <clears throat> waiting for, anticipating so I'm going to close. you got verse 7, Daniel 12, and we'll close. You're looking at it. 6, one said to the man dressed in linen. The one is Daniel, according to Bible scholars. That's verse 6. In verse 7, the angel says, it's, it's going to require a time, times, and a part, is what it actually says. A time, times, and a part. 1260 is time times and a half. 1290 is time times and a part. It's going to require time times and a part. And when he, that is the man of sin, shall have accomplished to scatter or break the power of the holy people. That's the two witnesses. And what does he do to the two witnesses? The man of sin. He murders them. He kills them. That is the last straw. That's it. God has worked miracles for 1260 days at the hands and the preaching of Moses and Elijah. They are clearly sent from heaven and they are put to death. And it's at that moment that Michael stands up. I'm trying to put these pieces together so that you don't see they're just floating around somewhere. There is an order to these events. 
So there's a seal placed upon God's people at a certain moment in time. How important is it? In chapter 6 of Revelation, we have Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. In chapter 7 of Revelation, we're going to back up with John in this process. And the angel, the command from heaven is, hold, hold, hold the winds. Don't allow the winds of strife to blow until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. That's this moment right here. Right here. The sealing word. Now, um, do you think of yourself as being worthy of being one of the remnant? Well, there's hope for you if you, if you uh, don't think that you're ready for sainthood. There's hope for you. Because this is not going to be our doing. It's going to be His doing with us, in us, through us, and for us. Does that make any sense at all? Yes. All right. So when the days are up, the 1,290 days are up, Tell me what happens. Come on. It's going to require time, times, and a part. That's the end of the 1290. Jesus says, or Michael says, from the time the daily is taken away and the abomination set up, 1290 days. Three and a half days after the two witnesses are murdered, a voice is heard from heaven. That's the voice of God saying, stand up and come up. Evidently, the 1,290 days have to do with this murdering of the two witnesses. Is there any part of this prophecy in Daniel that reaches beyond 1,290? A blessing is pronounced on those who wait and come to what day? So 1,290 from 1,335 is how many days? Wow. Wow. I haven't worked that one out yet. I've been trying for about 40 years plus. And when will it get worked out? When the time of the end comes and the Holy Spirit makes it clear. That's right. Well, uh, folk, we're all just, we're just flesh and blood. All of us. There was a time in my experience when I looked at flesh and blood as something that God frowned upon but I don't because I don't believe he frowns on any one of us I believe that you and I have a right purchased paid for by Jesus we have a right to come before God and ask for favors so my favor is this Lord in the day of handing out favors blot out my sins and not my name. Does that sound good? Does that sound right? Father in heaven, one day, and we believe soon now, one day we're going to see Jesus coming in the clouds with power and great glory, he said. All the angels of heaven are coming with him. We would be overcome by that sight, by that event, except you cover us with your light first. You shelter us, shield us, and seal us with your love and care. It may be that some of us, perhaps most of us, will sleep before Jesus comes. As long as our names are kept in the book of life, it matters not. What matters is that our names are written there. What matters is that we will hear his voice and recognize it. My sheep hear my voice and know me, and I know them. We thank you for the rich promises we have in the Advent hope and Advent message. I pray that we have a larger understanding today than our fathers before us. That's the way it should be. More light, more light, more light. We appeal for more light from heaven, more courage, we ask to be blessed in the blessed name, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.